Part two of Testus Germania. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Germania by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Brodrip. Part two. They all wrap themselves in a cloak which is fastened with a clasp, or, if this is not forthcoming, with a thorn leaving the rest of their persons bare. They pass whole days on the hearth by the fire. The wealthiest are distinguished by a dress which is not flowing, like that of the Sarmat and Parthi, but is tight and exhibits each limb. They also wear the skins of wild beasts. The tribes on the Rhine and Danube in a careless fashion, those of the interior with more elegance, as not obtaining other clothing by commerce. These select certain animals, the hides of which they strip off and vary them with the spotted skins of beasts, the produce of the outer ocean and of seas unknown to us. The women have the same dress as the men, except that they generally wrap themselves in linen garments, which they embroider with purple, and do not lengthen out the upper part of their clothing into sleeves. The upper and lower arm is thus bare, and the nearest part of the bosom is also exposed. Their marriage code, however, is strict, and indeed no part of their manners is more praiseworthy. Almost alone among barbarians they are content with one wife, except a very few among them, and these not from sensuality, but because their noble birth procures for them many offers of alliance. The wife does not bring a dower to the husband, but the husband to the wife. The parents and relatives are present, and pass judgment on the marriage gifts gifts not meant to suit a woman's taste, nor such as a bride would deck herself with, but oxen, a caparison steed, a shield, a lance, and a sword. With these presents the wife is espoused, and she herself in her turn brings her husband a gift of arms. This they count their strongest bond of union, these their sacred mysteries, these their gods of marriage. Lest the woman should think herself to stand apart from aspirations after noble deeds and from the perils of war, she is reminded by the ceremony which inaugurates marriage that she is her husband's partner in toil and danger, destined to suffer and to dare with him alike both in peace and in war. The yoked oxen, the harnessed steed, the gift of arms, proclaim this fact. She must live and die with the feeling that she is receiving what she must hand down to her children, neither tarnished nor depreciated, what future daughters-in-law may receive, and may be so passed on to her grandchildren. Thus, with their virtue protected, they live uncorrupted by the allurements of public shows or the stimulant of feastings. Clandestine correspondence is equally unknown to men and women. Very rare for so numerous a population is adultery the punishment for which is prompt and in the husband's power. Having cut off the hair of the adulteress and stripped her naked, he expels her from the house in the presence of her kinsfolk and then flogs her through the whole village. The loss of chastity meets with no indulgence, neither beauty, youth, nor wealth will procure the culprit a husband. No one in Germany laughs at vice, nor do they call it the fashion to corrupt and to be corrupted. Still better is the condition of those states in which only maidens are given in marriage, and where the hopes and expectations of a bride are then finally terminated. They receive one husband as having one body and one life, that they may have no thoughts beyond, no further reaching desires, that they may love not so much the husband as the married state. To limit the number of their children, or to destroy any of their subsequent offspring, is accounted infamous and good habits are here more effectual than good laws elsewhere. In every household the children, naked and filthy, grow up with those stout frames and limbs which we so much admire. Every mother suckles her own offspring, and never entrusts it to servants and nurses. The master is not distinguished from the slave by being brought up with greater delicacy. Both live amid the same flocks and lie on the same ground till the freeborn are distinguished by age and recognized by merit. The young men marry late, and their vigor is thus unimpaired. Nor are the maidens hurried into marriage. The same age and a similar stature is required. Well matched and vigorous they wed, and the offspring reproduce the strength of the parents. Sisters' sons are held in as much esteem by their uncles as by their fathers. Indeed, some regard the relation as even more sacred and binding, and prefer it in receiving hostages, 
thinking thus to secure a stronger hold on the affections and a wider bond for the family. But every man's own children are his heirs and successors, and there are no wills. Should there be no issue, the next in succession to the property are his brothers and his uncles on either side. The more relatives he has, the more numerous his connections, the more honoured is his old age, nor are there any advantages in childlessness. It is a duty among them to adopt the feuds as well as the friendships of a father or a kinsman. These feuds are not implacable. Even homicide is expiated by the payment of a certain number of cattle and of sheep, and the satisfaction is accepted by the entire family, greatly to the advantage of the state, since feuds are dangerous in proportion to a people's freedom. No nation indulges more profusely in entertainments and hospitality. To exclude any human being from their roof is thought impious. Every German, according to his means, receives his guest with a well-furnished table. When his supplies are exhausted, he who was but now the host becomes the guide and companion to further hospitality, and without invitation they go to the next house. It matters not, they are entertained with like cordiality. No one distinguishes between an acquaintance and a stranger, as regards the rights of hospitality. It is usual to give the departing guest whatever he may ask for, and a present in return is asked with as little hesitation. They are greatly charmed with gifts, but they expect no return for what they give, nor feel any obligation for what they receive. On waking from sleep, which they generally prolong to a late hour of the day, they take a bath, oftenest of warm water, which suits the country where winter is the longest of the seasons. After their bath they take their meal, each having a separate seat and table of his own. Then they go armed to business, or no less often to their festal meetings. To pass an entire day and night in drinking disgraces no one. Their quarrels, as might be expected with intoxicated people, are seldom fought out with mere abuse, but commonly with wounds and bloodshed. Yet it is at their feasts that they generally consult on the reconciliation of enemies, on the forming of matrimonial alliances, on the choice of chiefs, finally even on peace and war, for they think that at no time is the mind more open to simplicity of purpose or more warmed to noble aspirations. A race without either natural or acquired cunning, they disclose their hidden thoughts in the freedom of the festivity. Thus the sentiments of all having been discovered and laid bare, the discussion is renewed on the following day, and from each occasion its own peculiar advantage is derived. They deliberate when they have no power to dissemble. They resolve when error is impossible. A liquor for drinking is made out of barley or other grain, and fermented into a certain resemblance to wine. The dwellers on the river bank also buy wine. Their food is of a simple kind, consisting of wild fruit, fresh game, and curdled milk. They satisfy their hunger without elaborate preparation and without delicacies. In quenching their thirst they are not equally moderate. If you indulge their love of drinking by supplying them with as much as they desire, they will be overcome by their own vices as easily as by the arms of an enemy. One and the same kind of spectacle is always exhibited at every gathering. Naked youth who practice the sport bound in the dance amid swords and lances that threaten their lives. Experience gives them skill, and skill again gives grace. Profit or pay are out of the question. However reckless their pastime, its reward is the pleasure of the spectators. Strangely enough, they make games of hazard a serious occupation, even when sober, and so venturesome are they about gaining or losing, that, when every other resource has failed, on the last and final throw they stake the freedom of their own persons. The loser goes into voluntary slavery. Though the younger and stronger, he suffers himself to be bound and sold. Such is their stubborn persistency in a bad practice. They themselves call it honour. Slaves of this kind the owners part with in the way of commerce, and also to relieve themselves from the scandal of such a victory. The other slaves are not employed after our manner with distinct domestic duties assigned to them, but each one has the management of a house and home of his own. The master requires from the slave a certain quantity of grain, of cattle, and of clothing, as he would from a tenant, and this is the limit of subjection. All other household functions are discharged by the wife and children. 
To strike a slave, or to punish him with bonds or with hard labour, is a rare occurrence. They often kill them, not in enforcing strict discipline, but on the impulse of passion, as they would an enemy, only it is done with impunity. The freedmen do not rank much above slaves, and are seldom of any weight in the family, never in the state, with the exception of those tribes which are ruled by kings. There, indeed, they rise above the freed-born and the noble. Elsewhere, the inferiority of the freedman marks the freedom of the state. Of lending money on interest and increasing it by compound interest, they know nothing, a more effectual safeguard than if it were prohibited. Land proportioned to the number of inhabitants is occupied by the whole community in turn, and afterwards divided among them according to rank. A wide expanse of plains makes the partition easy. They till fresh fields every year, and they have still more land than enough. With the richness and extent of their soil, they do not laboriously exert themselves in planting orchards, enclosing meadows, and watering gardens. Corn is the only produce required from the earth. Hence, even the year itself is not divided by them into as many seasons as with us. Winter, spring, and summer have both a meaning and a name. The name and blessings of autumn are alike unknown. In their funerals there is no pomp. They simply observe the custom of burning the bodies of illustrious men with certain kinds of wood. They do not heap garments or spices on the funeral pile. The arms of the dead man, and in some cases his horse, are consigned to the fire. A turf mound forms the tomb. Monuments with their lofty elaborate splendor they reject as oppressive to the dead. Tears and lamentations they soon dismiss. Grief and sorrow but slowly. It is thought becoming for women to bewail, for men to remember the dead. Such on the whole is the account which I have received of the origin and manners of the entire German people. I will now touch on the institutions and religious rites of the separate tribes, pointing out how far they differ, and also what nations have migrated from Germany into Gaul. That highest authority, the great Julius, informs us that Gaul was once more powerful than Germany. Consequently, we may believe that Gauls even crossed over into Germany. For what a trifling obstacle would a river be to the various tribes as they grew in strength and wished to possess in exchange settlements which were still open to all and not partitioned among powerful monarchies? Accordingly, the country between the Hercynian forest and the rivers Rhine and Manus and that which lies beyond, was occupied respectively by the Helvetii and Boii, both tribes of Gaul. The name Boiamum still survives, marking the old tradition of the place, though the population has been changed. Whether, however, the Aravisci migrated into Pannonia from the Ossi, a German race, or whether the Ossi came from the Aravisci into Germany, as both nations still retain the same language, institutions, and customs, is a doubtful matter, for as they were once equally poor and equally free, either bank had the same attractions, the same drawbacks. The Treveri and Nervi are even eager in their claims of a German origin, thinking that the glory of this descent distinguishes them from the uniform level of Gallic effeminacy. The Rhine bank itself is occupied by tribes unquestionably German, the Vangiones, the Tribozzi, and the Nemetes nor do even the Ubii, though they have earned the distinction of being a Roman colony, and prefer to be called Agrippinensis, from the name of their founder, blush to own their origin. Having crossed the sea in former days, and given proof of their allegiance, they were settled on the Rhine bank itself, as those who might guard it, but need not be watched. Foremost among all these nations in valour, the Batavi occupy an island within the Rhine, and but a small portion of the bank. Formerly a tribe of the Chiati, they were forced by internal dissension to migrate to their present settlements, and there become a part of the Roman Empire. They yet retain the honourable badge of an ancient alliance, for they are not insulted by tribute, nor ground down by the tax-gatherer. Free from the usual burdens and contributions, and set apart for fighting purposes, like a magazine of arms, we reserve them for our wars. The subjection of the Matiazzi is of the same character. For the greatness of the Roman people has spread reverence for our empire beyond the Rhine and the old boundaries. 
Thus this nation, whose settlements and territories are on their own side of the river, are yet in sentiment and purpose one with us. In all other respects they resemble the Batavi, except that they still gain from the soil and climate of their native land a keener vigour. I should not reckon among the German tribes the cultivators of the tithe lands, although they are settled on the further side of the Rhine and Danube. Reckless adventurers from Gaul, emboldened by want, occupy this land of questionable ownership. After a while, our frontier having been advanced, and our military positions pushed forward, it was regarded as a remote nook of our empire and a part of a Roman province. Beyond them are the Chatti, whose settlements begin at the Hercynian forest, where the country is not so open and marshy as in the other cantons into which Germany stretches. They are found where there are hills, and with them grow less frequent, for the Hercynian forest keeps close till it has seen the last of its native chatti. Hardy frames, close-knit limbs, fierce countenances, and a peculiarly vigorous courage mark the tribe. For Germans they have much intelligence and sagacity. They promote their picked men to power, and obey those whom they promote. They keep their ranks, not their opportunities, check their impulses, portion out the day, entrench themselves by night, regard fortune as a doubtful, valour as an unfailing resource, and what is most unusual, and only given to systematic discipline, they rely more on the general than on the army. Their whole strength is in their infantry, which, in addition to its arms, is laden with iron tools and provisions. Other tribes you see going to battle, the Chatti to a campaign. Seldom do they engage in mere raids and casual encounters. It is indeed the peculiarity of a cavalry force quickly to win and as quickly to yield a victory. Fleetness and timidity go together. Deliberateness is more akin to steady courage. A practice, rare among the other German tribes and simply characteristic of individual prowess, has become general among the Chatti of letting the hair and beard grow as soon as they have attained manhood, and not till they have slain a foe laying aside that peculiar aspect which devotes and pledges them to valour. Over the spoiled and bleeding enemy they show their faces once more, then, and not till then, proclaiming that they have discharged the obligations of their birth and prove themselves worthy of their country and of their parents. The coward and the unwarlike remain unshorn. The bravest of them also wear an iron ring, which otherwise is a mark of disgrace among the people, until they have released themselves by the slaughter of a foe. Most of the Chatti delight in these fashions. Even hoary-headed men are distinguished by them, and are thus conspicuous alike to enemies and to fellow countrymen. To begin the battle always rests with them. They form the first line, an unusual spectacle. Nor, even in peace, do they assume a more civilized aspect. They have no home or land or occupation. They are supported by whomsoever they visit, as lavish of the property of others as they are regardless of their own, till at length the feebleness of age makes them unequal to so stern a valour. End of Part 2